William Henry is a historian, archaeologist, and author of a great and a great with a great love for the history and culture of Galway. He is a member of the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society and also a member of the Old Galway Society. He is a former director of the Galway Civic Trust and a member of the Renmore Military History Society. He is a former member of the Connacht Rangers Association and it was involved in many of their events, including taking groups on military tours. He was honoured by the National University of Ireland Galway with an honorary doctorate in 2011. And William is the author of Galway and the Great War, a book which explores all aspects of the effects of the war on Galway. A cordial, will you welcome William Thank Henry. You. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much, Kathleen, and to the committee for inviting me to speak um, a little bit about the, about the war and a little bit about uh, the return of the group. Um, you know, when, when Liam O'Faherty enlisted, like a lot of other young men, you know, he went away, and as you mentioned, Kathleen, when he came back, like, he had committed the great sin of fighting for king and country. I would say that 95% of the people, the men that went out to fight in the Great War, the last thing on their mind was king and country. It was, the, it was adventure, and more importantly, there was finance involved. And just a couple of streets from where we now stand, in 1918, a lady, she we lived up to a number of years ago, told her son, and the, the, the details were relayed to me after the book came out, that she remembered the day the war ended. She was standing in Key Street, and she said the women came out of their homes and they were actually weeping because the war was over. Because their, their husbands, their sons, would be demobbed within a month. And they would be back to where they were before the war. No finance coming in. So there's a huge amount of... We, we forget the details of why these men went to war. And O'Flaherty himself said, what an adventurous youth felt impelled to do. Not through idealism, but with the selfish desire to take part part in a world drama. He was going out there for adventure. So in a lot of cases that 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 was that that of course the site of course the, the swore in North of Allegiance, like everybody would have to swear in North of Allegiance, put into any military outfit. But that's that was the reason it's, it's very important to remember that when we're talking. Um, the Ball of the Great War explains very clearly why these men went out. A the chapter of the recruiting is two it's actually double all the rest of the chapters because that's what the sort the book actually started off as. It was to actually uncover the reasons why these men went out uh, to such a horrific uh, war. Of course, we're told it was going to be over by Christmas, 1914. The British, office, the British hierarchy told them that they would be home before Christmas, and the German Kaiser said, told his troops that they would be home before the leaves had fallen. You know, and four years later, they were still dying in the trenches of Normans and dying in Normans land, which the book, the... Um, the, the, the return of the brute is, is, is based on. And, you know, it, it was following like, his, his training that he, he went, went, went away to war. And of all years, 1917 is very important. The, the, whole, the, whole, the whole concept of the whole war from 1914, it was battle after battle after battle. But even by 1917, the command, the chief command, did not seem to realize like, how, to, how to fight trench warfare. They were still doing this, making the same mistakes, barrage after barrage after barrage, and then cut at 7.30 over the top and hope for the best. The idea was, in some cases, that the first line would definitely fall, the second line might get through, the third line, more of them get through, and the fourth line could definitely get through. And this, was the, this was the mindset behind some of the, the, the generals that were, that were fighting this war. And in the book, The Brute, the, 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 the Return of the Brute, there is one comment about that one officer that came up, when, when senior officer came up, who was about to smell of whiskey off him. And then another, in another part of the, the, the book, it mentions that they would love to see a general. And I remember a, in an interview with a man from Bohemore here in Galway, uh, J uh, Jack Kane, in 1979, he had an interview. And he, the, 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 the bottom line for Jack was that he had he'd seen such horrific um, he had such horrific experiences, and he told it very graphically. It's the first time he had actually spoke about the war. It was a priest that actually induced them to speak to uh, the to RTE on it. But when he did speak about it, it, it brought everything back to him. 
But he did mention this as well, that he, he didn't see generals on the front line. This is not me to, to you know, criticize them. It's a fact of war, a fact of the First World War, definitely. It was, it was happening right across. Like, um, Sir Alexander Haig said at quarter to nine in the morning, the Somme, while thousands of his men were being wiped out across the front, he said, things are going quite well at the front. This is what he wrote in his diary. How dare he? 67,000 casualties before the end of the day. Like, and then they tried to say that, oh, it was, it, it, it was the sacrifice was worth it for what they gained. It was not worth it. And it wasn't worth it in 1917. And the, the 1917, to me, the Psalm of 1917 is Passchendaele. And the same thing happened at Passchendaele, went right through. But the Passchendaele brought me, really, you know, when I, when I read the, the, uh, the Return of the Brute, it brought me right into where what Passchendaele was like. Not so much the Psalm, but definitely Passchendaele. Because it's, it's the rain, it's the mud, it's the lice, it's all of this that these people were played with. And uh, in his book, it's, the author, he's basing it really, I think, on, on his own experiences as, 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 as an Irish guard. And, you know, I know there has been people said that O'Flaherty was prone to exaggeration and that he, he possibly was, and I'm not disputing that at all. But certainly, his portrayal of the, of the, of the darkness of the, of the return of the brute, to me, uh, it's his mind, you know, going deeper into what was happening out there. And, you know, in order to explain it, this book, The Return of the Brute, um, he was deep into the bowels of, 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 of that area. It's based on, a, it's somewhere in Flanders, we don't, or in, on the Western Front. It doesn't actually say where, where, they, where it's based on. But it's a short novel, and it's about a group, a small group of British soldiers uh, in an unidentified area of the Western Front. And it tells the story of these ineffective soldiers as well, because, you know, they, 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 they didn't really get with the enemy, so to speak, but they were being sent into no man's land on a number of occasions. And although they were part of a much larger offensive, uh, it's not really apparent in, in the book. These young, these people, they, they get lost. They're victims of the mud, as I said, the random fire of the, of the enemy. And above all, there was endless annoyance between them, between some of them, which caused, you know, uh, aggression in, and, 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 in, and in the end to, to turn on each other. The squad was led by, uh, by Corporal John Williams, he was insensitive, arrogant, and somewhat cruel to the men under his command. Uh, and the other soldiers included George Appleby, Private George Appleby, a religious man, Michael Friel, Simon Jennings, Jeremiah MacDonald, who was kind of a glutton and a selfish man, uh, Daniel Riley, and Bill Gunn, William Bill Gunn, who was one of the courageous soldiers of it. But he was plagued by post-traumatic post post stress. He was there for two years at this stage. And with him was Private Louis Lamont, uh, a weakling of, 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 the, of, the, of the outfit, and James Shaw. The nine of them, the, the book centres around nine of them, but the main characters kind of come through in Corporal Williams, Louis Lamont, and uh, who, was, who was actually, he, he, he shouldn't have been there, in, well, he was 19 years of age, a lot of 19 year olds there, but he didn't have the courage uh, to, or, or the, the inclination to support his own soldiers in the trenches. And he was dependent constantly on William Gunn, who was a brave soldier, but who was, as I said, plagued by dramatic stress, and he was becoming mentally unbalanced. And the book opens, and to me, it just reminded me of, 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 of the front when I was, when I was going through um, some of the government that fought there in, in 1917 at, at, at E. At, um, at e. It says, hey, what's that? Do you hear something crawling along the ground to the right there? Gunn got to his feet and looked over the parapet. He peered into the darkness, then he turned his head to one side and listened. There was no sound but the droning of the rain falling on the sodden naked earth of the battlefront. I hear nothing, he said. Probably a rat, you heard. He yawned and added, God, is this rain ever going to stop? There's eight inches of it now at the bottom of the post already. And the rain, a passion deal, was, it was torrential for weeks. And you've got to, you've got to, you look, we see how bad it is out there tonight. And we were all in cars, we are indoors and all that. Can you imagine what it was like in those trenches, day after day, week after week, standing in that, getting a trench foot, which was a disease that they were, they were getting, not much is said about it. But you've got to bring yourself into that when you're reading the book. It's actually, if you want to go on a small bit, sorry, I tend to, I'll wrap it up the side, sorry. Um, 
They prefer to go back, but sorry, just one second. Yeah, let's go back there. Yeah, let's go back one more. We just want to leave it there for a second, you know? This one here, yeah. This one here, you know? yeah. yeah. It's, it's the soldiers trooping forward and trying to make the next, the next trench. And this is what the book portrays as well. These nine men being ordered forward to go across in single file, uh, led by their corporal, and to uh, take the enemy trenches that were that, that they either were occupied or unoccupied, but one way or another, were, that was their job to go forward and take them. And the story f it focuses around these doomed individuals, um, that you know that are going to, that will be killed or wounded uh, in a fruitless attempt to occupy a section that really isn't worth their lives. Bunn, as I said, is a brave soldier, but Levent, who's, who's actually talking to him when he's on sentry duty, he's plaguing him with conversation about uh, the situation, the negative talk about the situation that he finds himself in, and how he wants to go home, he wants to get a blighty, I'm not sure what a blighty, whether he was familiar with a blighty, blighty was, um, was a, a wound not severe enough to kill you, but severe enough to get you home. And a lot of soldiers wished for it, a lot of soldiers wounded themselves, he was mentioning this to Gunn, that if he could get a wound, if he would, more or less tell him that he'd self-inflicted, if he wouldn't inflict it, and he'd get out of there. And there was all this going on, and this was actually preying on, 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 on Gunn's mind, within Gunn's mind. And Lament was 19 years old, he was the youngest of the group, as I said, and Gunn protected him, uh, and had been for, for a couple of months at this stage. Um, but Gunn was being seriously affected, and he felt that he had to protect Lament for some reason, uh, um, and it pre particularly against Corporal Williams. Corporal Williams, as I said, was a, an arrogant man, um, a, a, you know, a, a kind of a strict disciplinarian uh, in, in, in the fort, which, which is required in, in these circumstances. However, Lament was sapping at the strength and the courage of Gunn, and he was getting more and more uh, into himself. Lament's mother was sending cakes to, um, to, 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 uh, let, to Lament, and she was asking him to share them with Gunn. She had written to Gunn as well. He had obviously told her uh, that, that this man was looking after him and would he keep up the protection of him. Now I know you might laugh that the mother was sending cakes, which she actually was. Um, if there was other, other items of, of, um, of, uh, that, that were being sent out there. Uh, just get one there, I think it's in the back here. It's here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a replica of what these soldiers were wearing because it's actually mentioned in the book. This, it's a, it's like a body clava. It's like a head. I pass it around. People can have a look at it. And um, I'll pass it on there. Um, <clears throat> that's actually taken from a pattern. That's made from a pattern that we discovered um, in one of the newspapers that the women were asked with the knit these and send them out to the soldiers and uh, knit socks. There was one woman from Ballinasloe, incidentally, knitted a pair of socks every week and sent them out, right for the whole duration of the war. You know, and where they were all getting the Victoria Cross and all this cross, this woman was forgotten, like you know, and she was that was the home guard, really, without a doubt. But that's just an idea of what it, what it was like. This is what they're wearing under the helmets and that, and that, I'll be explaining a little bit about that in a while. Um, Gunn became came to you know to, to, to resent the corporal for the manner in which he treated the boy, and also in the coming hours for the abuse and that he was subjected to himself by, by, the, by, the, by the corporal. And it's, Gunn starts, it's, this, it's this stage that Gunn starts to uh, starts turning to the brute uh, of the title. Uh, the conditions that we're in go out to extreme, extreme <coughs> beyond, beyond belief. It's hard, it's hard to credit what the, what the word. And it, you know, the book, while the book is, is um, would, would think like that it was totally exaggerated, um, there's a couple of slides that we'll go on and we'll, I'll show you. If you want to go up to the. <coughs> that one, yes, yeah, sorry. But, um, you know, they, they, I've just shown a couple of. Only, you'd want to look a few, there's just a few examples of the mud, you know. Um, they were now in, 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 in a position where they were being be ordered to go forward uh, within a couple of hours. This really kind of started for. for, for the, the book really starts on the 20th of March 1917. And it moves on for a day. It, it, it all happens in a space of uh, less than two days. They became silent, standing side by side, looking out into the darkness <coughs> over the parapet. With their steel hats, their oilskins, which they wore, laced about their throats, their great coats. They looked like ghouls in the gloom, buried up to their waist in the hole, while all around them the earth was na lay naked, 
turned into mud, holed, covered with horrid debris of war, emitting a stench of rotting and buried corpses. And um, Jack King, in his, in his interview, mentions that about the unburied corpses. And what he, mean, what, he, what he tells the interviewer at the time, he talks about the burial detail and how the burial detail, they would bury their soldiers at dusk or whatever. And when the bombardment would start again, the soldiers that were buried, would, they would be, their bodies would be actually exhumed with the, with the explosions, along with the dead that there was already, that was being, being perpetrated by the explosions themselves. But he said there were horrific sights. Par then the book goes into this as well. Partial, partial pieces of bodies uh, coming over the parapet. Um, and you know the, the stench of the death and the whole lot. So O'Flaherty, I don't think was ex exaggerating in this. That as I said, the book is very dark. The story is, is fiction, but he's the thought, behind, the thought process behind it. He witnessed something out there uh, similar to what he, what, he, what, he was, what he was writing about. Now, uh, as I said, Gunn developed a, a, a hatred against Corporal Williams. Now, at one stage, and I'm not going to go into the full book. I, I, I understand Kathleen the time and. I don't want to, certainly don't want to intrude on your, on your, on your night. Um, at one stage, there's a number of incidents, right, but one stage, Gunn fires a few shots. He's losing, he's kind of losing his mind, and he's, he's waiting for action, and he wants to go to action. And this was one of the things as well about some of the soldiers in the Western Front. They became so anxious, waiting and waiting and waiting, and the, you know, the, the absolute uh, desolation of it. And they just wanted to do something, go forward, Take the enemy or die in the process. A lot of them had this in their minds. The gun wasn't wasn't it was one of these, and he fired off a number of shots against an enemy position without uh, having the orders. Now, of course, he was taken uh, taken to task on it because he was giving away their, their 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 positions. But and this is what he was accused of. But it was well known that Germans knew exactly that these guys could throw bars of chocolates to each other if they wanted. Uh, that's how close they were. So. Giving away position was a bit much, to be honest with you, on the Western Front, you know, because the Germans knew exactly where the British were, the British knew exactly where the Germans were, and the snipers were going all the time. It was constant. And in fact, there was actually conversations between snipers and soldiers, you know, and, uh, you know, like it was an, an encouragement to put up your head at some stage and shout abuse and then to get it taken off, you know, and this was, this was, this was applied a number of times, as well as that, there's an old, I don't know how, le it's a legend. It's, um, you know, people like a match years ago, people wouldn't take the third, li the third light years ago. You know, I'm talking about, for some reason, I asked one time, what was that for? And they said, First World War, one, two, and the US exactly where the third one was. You know, this is, you know, story, I don't know how true it is, but I just said I thought, I didn't actually publish it, because I, I was I, unsure of, 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 the, of the, the talk behind it. Now, when, after this, you know, uh, Gunn is taken to task by Corporal Gunn, or by Corporal uh, Williams, and it says, uh, Gunn, uh, stared at Williams after the, the dressing down he got. He stared at the corporal, breathing heavily, swaying back and forth. His eyes became blurred, and he began to have a curious hallucination that the corporal was now becoming transformed into a hairy animal, a brute that he now wanted to kill. And the brute is coming into it now, and it becomes more and more prevalent in, in, in the book as it goes on. A kind of corporal Williams, for the most part, was actually afraid of Gunn. And although Gunn had saved his life twice, um, he still, he still uh, treated him with such disrespect at times. Now, one of the reasons as well that the corporal was totally against Gunn was Gunn was very carpet carrying in, in the book, like he was carrying the weapon for Le Mans. Like, look, come on, you're in the Western Front. There's, you're up against, uh, you know, a, a professional army out there. And Gunn is carrying this guy's weapon because he's not carrying it himself. He's not prepared to carry it himself. Like. So you can imagine the corporal, like, Kind of losing, as the fellow said, losing the plot. You know, you'd lose the plot yourself if you saw that going on. You know, they're out there. They, 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 so young soldier like doesn't need a servant going over the top. He needs a gun. You know, so that's kind of where where the corporal was coming from. I'm looking at it from both sides of, of, of the fence, so to speak. Uh, so uh, this is one of the reasons that, as I said, that that that, that the corporal was so um, so densely against, seemingly densely against gun and and Le Mans. Uh, they were then ordered to uh, approach, to, to move forward to capture an enemy, an, enemy, an enemy trench. And they got totally lost in no man's land. They got trapped in barbed wire. Um, they had to try and make their way back. <coughs> uh, and they, uh, they couldn't get back, so they made their way to the right of the area they were in. And they stumbled on 
uh, an evacuated German trench and they had achieved their goal, they got into the trench. The mud was so thick and heavy in the trench that they were told not to go to certain areas of it. But uh, George Appleby, who was a religious man, went to get, went to get rations. The rash, he had his rations between, um, went back to get his rations and seemingly went into the wrong part of the trench and th the mud began to swallow him. And he was in his knees and the more he moved, the more he started to go down. Corporal Williams was called and he tried to rescue him, but Williams fell into the mud himself and had to be rescued by gun. Appleby uh, was, was, was now in a situation where he, there was no way out for him. No matter how he struggled, he was going down and down and down. And it might have, uh, might, uh, Private Michael Freer watched helplessly as, Ap as, as, as Appleby ceased to exist. He had thrown back his head and stared at the sky with fixed eyes, with his tongue hanging out, taken still in yellow on his green lower lip. Raindrops fell into his open mouth. Then he disappeared without with disappeared with a gentle sucking sound into the morass, unnoticed except by Freel. In another moment, all that was left to mark his presence was a series of circular wrinkles in the slime that covered the surface. Now, um, <clears throat> as I said about the mud, it's constantly in the book, and I want to include that because the mud, a lot of the soldiers were actually drowned in the mud, and as as indeed were horses. Um, a huge amount of them, and it was something that the the the, the interviewers with, with some of the men that, that came back from Passchendaele that they, they, that was one of the things that, that that was forever in their mind was the desolate mud landscape that there was no hope, no way out of. If they fell off the duck boards, if you want to go, so you've gone through them, you've got um, You can see the duck boards here, or there, I think. If you fell off the duck boards, you were you were in serious trouble, and in a lot of cases, soldiers did not have the time. And they could not, in a lot of cases, help their own comrades once they fell in. Sometimes they were left to your own device. If you're under fire, you had to think of, you had to think of, 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 of your other soldiers that were now in, in your charge. If somebody, it was unfortunate, but that's the way it was. And that's why, you know, after the war, there was quite a number of men actually uh, suffered, like Neymar Farrington himself, uh, for instance, suffered, you know, um, nervous breakdowns. And in fact, there was a, a, quite a number of suicides. People don't realise that the suicides went on for 20 years after the war. They're not, they're not um, accounted as, 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 um, as casualties of war. But in fact, they are. <coughs> now, as I said, uh, Jeremiah Mac MacDonald, he was, uh, he, was, he, was kind of, he was he was the guy that had these uh, rations with, with Appleby. It goes to show you the, the mentality of some of the characters that he has in it. Um, when Appleby was drowned in the mud, all MacDonald was concerned about was the rations. He had the rations with him. No, he was out of rations. So he, he actually um, broke into his iron rations. Now, for those who are not aware of iron rations, iron rations were rations outside the normal rations. And there were rations that you were never supposed to open unless you were trapped behind enemy lines and there was no way back for you. These were, uh, these were, these were rations that you had to, that were known to the military as military slang as iron rations. And he opens his iron rations and starts to divulge into them. And he's taken to task. But he's, 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 uh, he's, he gets away with it because a uh, gun again comes into conflict with the corporal when a visiting sergeant spots Lamont sitting on the ground uh, actually just nothing there sitting the night was freezing and Lamont sits down and gun takes it that's his way out he sits down and just dies he just freezes to death and um, the one by one they all succumb to the, the conditions some of them were shot, some of them were blown up. But in the end, there's four of them left. William Gunn, Daniel Riley, Jeremiah MacDonald, and Corporal Williams. Now, Daniel Riley in the book, the character him in the book, he's the man that said, we're never going to get out of here. We'll never get out of life. We're all doomed. This is, this is what's going ahead of us. So you can imagine, you wouldn't want that beside you in the trenches, to be honest with you. But this was his, this was his thought frame. But at one stage, they go to relieve themselves. In a, in a hole in, in, in the end of the, in the, in the trench. And they were, had been ordered to go forward again. The sergeant had come back and ordered them to go. You have to go forward again and dig in. And they were laughing at this, like the actual the lunacy of it, digging into the mud. What were you going to do? Dig up the mud? You know, there was no way. It was, no, it was impossible to dig in that weather, as I said, with the, with the, with the conditions. And Riley, while he's relieving himself, sorry to be graphic, but that's, the, just, just, that's in the book. It's, it's part of the, the whole 
the whole, let's say, the whole culture of, of, of the First World War, of the French warfare. Warns the corporal that gun is known, he's really gone insane, and that he's becoming very dangerous. And he, he tells him of other instances where soldiers had, you know, become uh, deranged, had hallucinations and killed their comrades. And, uh, but the corporal would not give in. He wouldn't allow him to be sent back to the base camp. And he said, he won't, he won't be allowed back until I'm going back. So the end of the story kind of comes when, when he, the, the, Riley, is, Riley is actually very disappointed in the corporal. And he said he'd go forward and leave Gunn behind. But he said, no, Gunn is coming with me. So uh, he orders Riley to stay back, stay behind in the trench. And he takes MacDonald and Gunn with him. So they move off towards enemy trenches, crawling across almost frozen, muddy landscape. At this stage, Gunn could see nothing but belch fire in his eyes, the words, now, kill him now, kill him now. This is what was coming to him. And he's crawling behind him, and he's his eyes set on his back, just watching for his moment. And then he becomes aware. And O'Farty describes it very well, the hallucination. And I wonder about O'Farty's hallucinations himself. He said, now he was aware of a vast multitude of brutes crawling with him, tracking the corporal. He no longer feared the brutes, but felt akin to them and savagely proud of their hairy bodies and their smell and the snorting of their breath. On all sides, rose, they rose in myriads, some enormous, some as small as ferrets, some with monstrous bellies, some as thick as, as ten as snaves, all protruding fangs and eyes that belched with fire. All made the same sound as they moved, a patting of fur paws like a patting of heavy raindrops on a lake. So they're moving forward and they come to a couple of shell holes in no man's land. The enemy opened fire and they have to dive for cover. The corporal and, and, and MacDonald dive into one shell hole and Gunn drives, in, drives into another one on his own. And he's sitting there while the shots are going off and then he says, he sees now, now is the time to react, now is the time to act. He had little time for either of them in the two trenches, in the, in the trench beside him, either Gunn or MacDonald. And he's decided that he was going to end it now. So he pulled the bills bomb and pulled the pen. He stood up into the, in, the, in the hole and pitched it at the corporal's uh, uh, hole. MacDonald spots Gunn doing this <coughs> and shouts a warning. But he, he's, he's too late himself. The corporal manages to get out of the trench, out of, out of, the, out of the shell hole, but the, the bomb actually struck MacDonald in the head and exploded as it fell to the ground, killing him instantly. And it's a little bit more graphic than that in the book, to be honest with you, you know, but the, the corporal then and, and go and face each other in no man's land, both with rifles. One with you, the, 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 the corporal with his bayonet fixed, coming at gun, but gun using his as a club. And both of them lose the rifles in the, in the fight that, 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 that follows. And Gunn becomes overwhelmed with strength and this insane uh, you know, task to kill the corporal. And he crawls up, to his, up his body, gets his hands around the corporal's throat and squeezes the life out of him. The corporal dies there on the Western Front and Gunn now gets up and is shot by a German bullet. It's taken down for a moment, but he gets up again, and this time he runs with his hands over his head, around in a circle, almost wishing death, and the German machine gun opens up and riddles him. Riddled with bullets, he died, bellowing and flying in the earth. And there the book ends. Uh, to me, like, it was, it, was, it was a dark book. It was a very fast book to read, I mean, to be honest with you. Um, uh, but it did bring back the message of the, of the trench warfare for me. It, it brought back passion there more so than any place else. Now, I know that O'Flaherty wasn't that passion there because he was wounded. He was September, I think he was, so he wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been that passion there. But certainly, he would have known the stories, and certainly he would have seen other horrific winters in, in like in, in, in different times. Like it's based in March, and he would have been there in the early part of 1916, coming up to the Somme. As you said, I don't think he wanted to ever speak about the Somme, Catherine. Maybe correct in that. For me, um, 
I was asked a number of years ago to write an article on Liam O'Flaherty. I didn't know enough about both of them to be told, and I still, I can't still say, I could still say that I'm not an expert on that, not by a long shot. But what I became interested was the fact that he was in the war. I didn't actually know that when I started researching um, the, 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 the article. And, and that became very interesting for me because I'm actually collecting Galway soldiers and photographs of Galway soldiers that fought in the Great War. I've got 140 of them now at this stage. Uh, and um, that's why I became interested in it. And then uh, you mentioned the book to me, kind of the, 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 the Return of the Brute. And I said, I must read it to see what, it's, what this book is about. But I was totally taken by it because, because of the terrific conditions that these men were forced to fight under. And that's the one thing that, again, when you, re when you look at some of the the um, the 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 the, the, um, let's say the the survivors of that, the conditions that they fought in was just horrific. They never forgot the conditions. They forgot so a lot of them forgot the Germans, but they, didn't, they never forgot the conditions. So look, thank you very much for listening to this work. <laughs> Well, thanks for that. Thank you.